Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing a new book called End of the World, Civilization and Its Fate with the author, John Mills. John, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me, David. Book. Um, am I correct in understanding that this book suggests that it's almost certain doom for humanity, doomed by forces beyond its control, including mysterious inner forces, nonetheless beyond our control? And if so, even if one could know that were true, why write the book as opposed to going on vacation in the time remaining? Well, I, I don't know if I'm that pessimistic, um, but I certainly am concerned enough to uh, to have taken the effort to to map out what I believe are major existential threats to our existence, with the hope that uh, people start paying attention and um, become more self-conscious of of the fate that that you know, blinds us. So um, I'm hoping it to be a motivation to try to ameliorate the dangers that um, are looming uh, before our, our very eyes. Uh, to answer though why I would write it, um, there's you know obviously many reasons why people are motivated on a certain topic and particularly an intellectual and academic one. But this actually uh, started about 25 years ago, when I was uh, interested in one of your favorite topics, and that's uh, war and human aggression and the problem of evil. And you know, after writing a paper on that, um, I particularly was interested in, in uh, Einstein's correspondence with Sigmund Freud on why war that led me to, um, to delve deep into uh, civilization and its discontent. So, um, but over the years, having um, gone through uh, the mere fact that our world population has doubled since 1980, and that we um, are the among the most people who have ever lived in the history of the world timeline, um, I started to become interested in other uh, topics, such as the doomsday argument, um, such as uh, uh, the threat of a nuclear holocaust. And then, and then with the fact that watching the world deteriorate in terms of our ecosystems and in terms of the environmental uh, climate crisis, not to mention wildfires that are burning uh, about an hour from my house, um, I started to uh, get into these uh, these areas, and and then I realized uh, I should make a book out of it. And and then of course when the pandemic hit, <laughs> we're all cooped up like chickens for for years. <laughs> yeah. uh, I finally I finally finished the project. You you start out with a discussion of the bystander effect. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that is and what, if anything, can be done about it? Well, I, I borrowed a metaphor uh, from social uh, sciences and social psychologists who studied uh, the bystander effect or bystander apathy. And I applied it to uh, the global climate crisis. And so if we were to use the analogy that we are, as humanity, most of us uh, are, are aware to at least some degree of our looming threats to our environment um, collapsing, uh, possibly in the near future, but at some point, if we don't um, curb our emissions and start to decarbonize on some level and get into renewables and things like this that climate scientists have been uh, warning us about for decades. Um, that we're kind of like standing back, watching the crime being committed. Nobody wants to do anything. Nobody wants to speak out. They uh, don't want to get their hands dirty. Uh, and it's it's 
somewhat is analogous to uh, why is it that people are so passive and, and apathetic to our plight, not to mention that, um, uh, yeah, not, not, I mean, not to mention that you have climate denialism in general. So uh, not, not many people, I believe, really believe this is all a hoax. But nevertheless, it just takes a few people to be skeptical, to uh, question climate science, earth science systems, and, and uh, thousands of, of uh, specialists who, who focus on this every day. So that, yeah, one chapter is about trying to set the stage for um, we need to you know, be much more aware and wake up uh, to our ecological emergency. The analysis in the book suggests that, you know, people in general just don't care. The great masses just don't care. It seems to me sometimes they care, sometimes they don't. If it's September 11th, 2001, their televisions tell them to care and they care. If it's this past weekend and it's Israel burning families alive in tents or it's climate change, the corporate media tells them not to care and they don't care. But the corporate media doesn't seem to me to be biology or destiny. It just seems to me to be a handful of corporations that could be changed, right? Well, you make a good point. Um, like, if if one of our biggest dangers to um, you know human existence or the planetary existence is that we can no longer rely on information, that we cannot tell you know, what is true from what is not, and that there are actors that are manipulating the types of information that we get. Most of us, you know, we cannot live our lives where we're, we're conscientious researchers and journalists. We have to rely upon on the news on some level. And um, it's easy to manip manipulate the masses. You just show, uh, like you said, a bunch of the, the burnt, burnt up babies to a crisp enough to um, you know move us to action and certainly to moral outrage but um, it could this happens every day all over the world yeah, and the context changes but you're right uh, to what degree should uh, you know should media outlets be more regulated so we are given a fair distribution of, uh, of information. It, I mean, it always seems to me there are a couple problems with apathy versus activism and the media. One is that, that, as you say, there just isn't remotely the sort of activism that there should be. But the other is that we're never told of all that there is. Uh, I mean, here where I live in Virginia, they wanted to put a giant pipeline uh methane gas uh, the atlantic coast pipeline through and everyone was told it was absolutely inevitable cannot be stopped and people nonetheless raised hell until they stopped it um and you know they were just as just as human had the exact same dna as all the humans destined to sit on their couch and do nothing right so it, we have a choice right to be like that or to be like that um it's it, or are, are we are we really doomed to do nothing when there are millions of people doing everything they possibly can uh, and we're hardly ever being told about it? Well, you also you know, make a good point that when, when, when these things affect us personally, we're more likely to get involved. We're more likely to get off our duff and, and be vocal and um, become more political and socially active. Um, but when things kind of happen over there, you know, to some arbitrary stranger in a foreign land that has nothing to do with the average citizen in, in their particular uh, community, that's, that's where people just associate these realities. It's like it's just an abstraction that doesn't affect their immediate existence, and, and they're more likely to psychologically then um, you know, engage in typical, um, you know, defenses that help us function, or, or we'd all be basket cases if we, we didn't. 
there, but we we know some ways to mitigate that problem, right? We know some ways to start to work around it. If you show everybody Ukrainian victims, uh, they take an interest in Ukraine, just as if you were to show them Palestinian victims, they would take an interest in in Palestine, right? Well, sure, sure. I mean, people um, are mobilized in, in various ways. So, um, uh, but do they take in account people equally, people suffering equally? Um, I, I would imagine that we would become over, we just overwhelmed if we had to take on every single cause, every single group or person or country suffering. Uh, and so people are selective, I think, about what they are shown in terms of imagery, in terms of the symbolism, and how that resonates with their own personal, if not ethnic or cultural identity. And that's what moves them more to, I think, act. In fact, in the book, you sort of argue that racism is just universal, is is built in. Um, and I, I know you don't mean that those people working night and day against racism don't exist. Um, I think you mean they're doomed to failure and those who promote racism are doomed, are, are destined to succeed. Um, but it seems to me the same thing was said about sexism and homophobia and theism. And, you know, there are all kinds of beliefs that are declared to be permanent and inevitable, and yet they can be changed, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, let me clarify that we shouldn't be under the illusion that um, uh, we're not... Uh, all of us have human vulnerabilities and proclivities toward prejudice because we all do. It's just a matter of degree and how it manifests. So, I mean, everybody forms judgments that they um, project onto other people without having any experience whatsoever. It's just an unconscious process. Um, and, and yet um, there are those who de de develop a hate an antipathy for the other. And so, you know, uh, to the point that it's a simple, uh, you know, a simple um, equation in their mind, whether it be skin color from a different country, different language, um, uh, the way they look, gender, you, you name it. Uh, but this, you know, racism in various forms, whether they be subtle, whether they be implicit, or whether they be explicitly acted out in you know hate, heinous ways um that that i believe you know has existed ever since there's been human beings um the object of hate is uh based in fear and, and people are threatened by their presence um but xenophobia bigotry you know uh, fear of immigration i mean and we see this all in, in you know on all continents continents. Um, it just is um, regional or it's localized. Can it be ameliorated or mitigated? Absolutely. And that's the point. Um, the point is developing a sense of self-consciousness or an ethical uh, awareness of, of, of alterity or the other as being human, uh, a we rather than they. Um, and when you start to become more empathic and recognize the existence of otherness, uh, it can generally change to having more empathy and, and no need to dehumanize the other. Well, we need, I think, a lot more of that. Um, we're speaking with John Mills. The book is called End of the World, Civilization and Its Fate. Um, I think uh, I, I think John, you might say I'm a, I'm an arrogant human uh, when I you know read comparisons to studies with with rats. Um, I, I want to say you know, but I'm not a rat, you know, and and so the, there there's a chapter that looks at overpopulation and in rats you have overpopulation you have violence. 
it seems to me most of the evidence is from rats that wars don't actually correlate with uh with overpopulation yet anyway they correlate with militarism and armaments and petroleum and and various other factors um but not with population density um am, am i wrong well i was uh, borrowing you know so uh ethological experiments from uh, you know uh, John Calhoun so who, who famously studied mice and rats and, and deliberately created a perfect environment for them they have shelter food water limited um, uh, security because there's no predation and then over time they started to cannibalize each other and the whole population um, died out. So I, I was simply uh, using it as an analogy, not wanting to, to reduce the human being in some crass, ontological, reductive way to, uh, to a, a rat or a mouse. Um, but, but found it quite interesting, uh, especially looking at people who are concerned about overpopulation. You know, what's, what is going to happen when we get the 10 billion people? Um, when there's overcrowding, uh, when the population density then uh, could breed more aggression. Um, there will be food supply and water su uh, shortages, um, distribution issues, land scarcity, increased pandemic, um, you know, and probably some economic paralysis, if not leading to more um, downward mobility. Uh, if not some type of form of societal collapse, particularly in uh, developing worlds, developing countries. So um, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, you know, more people, you know, more warming, less food, less water, less land. Uh, I mean, and then less money. People won't be able to afford these basic necessities. So to me, that's a perfect formula for death. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. I can't imagine anything more important than more people getting concerned about that. Um, I mean, there would be nothing better for the world than everybody immediately getting concerned about that. I just I just don't want to lose the notion of of human agency because I don't think I'm exactly a rat. Uh, and I think that that tough circumstances lead to, to violence and wars if people choose to allow them to lead to violence and wars and not otherwise. Um, I, I think you suggest in the book that, that, that mass radical change just isn't a thing. Uh, and yet I think the world got rid of slavery and serfdom in a matter of decades. We've seen women's rights uh, on a radical uh, growth path. Um, and, and I think new and unexpected things are possible that that you say in the book that we are newly slaves to our computer screens that I'm sitting in front of right now. Um, and I think Western society itself is relatively new in terms of our species. Um, I, I, I just doesn't it make radical change less likely to tell everybody it's not likely. Well, the, these are tough questions to know uh, how to how to answer. Um, in many ways, uh, I can't you know I can't predict the future. I can only predict certain possible scenarios. And um, in the book, I try to balance the uh, the pros and the cons uh, with future probabilities, including our moral futures. So what you're saying is that if people become, um, you know, if they wake up, they become interested in ecological justice and, and um, environment, you know, more or less, uh, you know, in, interested in working towards mitigation or restoration, rehabilitation, uh, and sustainment, um, that would be one hope. And it, it, may, it may take a, a radical event like the pandemic to change uh, people radically, where they are, they're positioned to 
want, as you say, adopt a certain uh, agentic stance toward act, toward activism. Um, it could also, um, uh, you know, it all it could also lead to though panic and violence and aggression and crime and a number of things that happen when people's basic security uh, or basic needs are not met. And so um, that that is one I think big threat with the old, with potential for overpopulation. Um, but given that we can prepare for it, um, we should be doing more of that now. Um, I think you very well might be right that a big event needs to change things, but it has to be a big event combined with the right response, right? September 11th could have led to, oh my God, all these nuclear weapons aren't doing a darn thing to protect us. Let's get rid of them. Instead, it led to 20 years of war. Uh, the pandemic could have led to, let's stop monkeying around with biological weapons. Instead, it led to, ah, let's hate China some more. Like it, it, We have to somehow be prepared to have the right response to the big event, right? Well, these are complex issues, um, but I'm in agreement that uh, even Ronald Reagan wanted to uh, have complete disarmament. Um, and um, now, uh, now we are more concerned about replenishing our stockpiles rather than, you know, getting rid of, uh, you know, nuclear missiles. So um, wouldn't it wouldn't it be the most rational and sane thing to do is to get rid of these these weapons of mass destruction? Of course, but people in in charge are psychopathic leaders, and so. They don't want to give up these things, uh, and neither do uh, the, you know greater security measures and and corporate capitalism, um, because we don't trust the other. Uh, you know the I guess you know you in the United States here. I'm in Canada, um, but I believe the United States won't even sign a, a treatise on. Uh, they won't be the first to to use nuclear weapons. It would only be a, in a reaction uh, to someone else initiating a, an attack. Um, nobody wants to give up the upper hand. Uh, is this going to be a new uh, a new Cold War? Um, it it makes no sense. Uh, if, if anything, it would be learning how to deal with. Uh, nuclear energy in responsible ways that help people, not uh, create the conditions that could destroy us. In, in the book, John Mills, you include a list of great suggestions from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, you know, stop building the nukes, reinstate the treaties, et cetera. We ought to do that whole list of things, right? Well, again, reason tells me yes. Uh, ethical self-consciousness uh, and moral judgment tells me yes. Um, but this is not the way everyone thinks. And and people um, uh, people want power and they want uh, hegemonic control and they want to be able to, to have um, their self-interest and their capital um, investment uh, uh, returns and um, et cetera that, dri that, that drives the world. So. The vast majority of people don't have any such things, um, capital investment returns. I mean, we seem to be jumping from psychopathic leaders to average human. Uh, it seems to me if we had representative, non-corrupt governments, we'd be in pretty darn good shape. People in surveys, even if they aren't sufficiently active on it, want peace, justice, sustainability, uh, far better than you would think from looking at the behaviors of their so-called representative governments, um, which is why I wonder about analyzing the average person versus figuring out how to get a representative government. Well, um, well put. Uh, why, why, do the pe why are some people not even interested in voting? When that's the only control you have, 
because there's nobody worth voting for and nothing's ever been changed by voting and the women didn't vote themselves the right to vote and change has always come through mass nonviolent action outside of voting maybe well um how do we change um, our governments or our representatives or our leaders at least in, in democratic countries it's, it's to uh cast your own vote for who you think would be best, even if there, if there are four candidates to begin with. Um, in non-democratic countries, uh, totalitarian countries, um, those governed by uh, uh, you know, terrorism, and, et cetera, or, or just despots and people who clamp down on their, on their citizenry, they have even less control so it's a big problem, uh, I mean, massive, of course, and hard, hard, not easy to understand, let alone fix. I could not agree more. Um, we got just about two minutes left. Um, it seems to me a lot of people, and I, and I read this in the book as well, think that things are going to go on being decided by violence if not by verbal persuasion. And it seems to me there's a whole world out there of nonviolent activism that the US civil rights movement, the Arab Spring in Tunisia, the ending of apartheid in South Africa, you know, did not consist of publishing a paper. They, they consisted of a whole other area of activity that's left out of the world presented by your television, vote or do nothing. Um, there, there are other things to do, right? Well, there are. I guess it just depends upon what what one feels they can accomplish. Uh, and so, like on some level, we can only do so much as, as individuals. We would require collective action on a mass scale, and maybe it starts with a small uh, group of concerned people who have certain values that they want to keep pressing. Uh, for people to become aware of. And so you you have to do what you can do uh, like yourself. So I I do value the fact that you are you're vocal about your values. And and hopefully other people will, will identify with them and get involved. Well Margaret Mead said nothing else has ever changed the world than starting with a small group. I I can't predict whether that's right or whether we've have a chance, but uh, got to go down fighting. Uh, the book is called End of the World, Civilization and Its Fate by John Mills. John, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you very much for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.